Okay, the basics of how to work with a computer, which I believe is chapter 28 in the reading. Here's the identified learning objectives uh, for this section. We're going to talk about hardware and software and how they interact to perform tasks. We'll talk about the main components of a CPU, a central processing unit, where that's situated um, in a computer and how we use it uh, to direct tasks for the computer. We'll talk about the characteristics of digital memory. We'll discuss the conversion of analog to digital data. We'll at least give a definition of what that is and the provisional idea of how it works. We'll get more into the nuts and bolts of it later in the trimester. We'll talk about general types of machine languages, so computer codes and things like that. Uh, we'll talk about four levels of data processing and why that's important. And then the final thing is we'll talk about aspects of teleradiology. We'll at least define the different parts of teleradiology and what teleradiology is. So hardware. These are the physical components, the things that you could actually touch. You can point to where they're at, and, uh, and we may not be able to say what they do, but they have a physical presence somewhere on the computer. Um, the biggest one, probably the most important one, is an integrated circuit, right? Sometimes abbreviated IC, but this integrated circuit is a very special integrated circuit called the central processing unit. So what does it mean that it's an integrated circuit? Well, as you may remember from foundations or from physics, circuitry is all the little wires and resistors and things that um, electricity can flow through, right? So an integrated circuit is a set of wires and resistors and capacitors and all sorts of different mechanisms that work very closely together. That's what integrated means. Um, so they're fully integrated in the way that the electricity is running through them. And we'll look at ways that they're integrated uh, here in a minute. Um, but they direct then the flow of information from input, output, and different memory storage devices. And you might be thinking, well, what kind of information? Well, it's largely electrical information, right? We said that circuits, electricity runs through circuits. And so this CPU, this integrated circuit, is going to be directing electrical impulses, which then can be read out, right? You might be wondering, okay, well, how is something electrical read out? <coughs> well, it's very simple. Like, my four-year-old kind of knows how it works, right? He's at this point in his life where he likes to turn light switches on and off, right? So on is one kind of information. Off is a different kind of information. And that's exactly how... The information is stored and used on a computer. The fancy word for it is binary. It's either a one or a zero, right? On or off. So we have a lot of little switches within this CPU that are used in a special way. But the big takeaway here is that it's gonna direct this flow of information, um, input and output, from different banks of memory. A bus is a multi-wire line that carries data. Um, and very often, these, these wires, uh, they may be fiber optic, they may be uh, wire, they may be actual physical wire, they may be very small things embedded in silicone, right? Um, and that's what we're generally talking about when we talk about computers. A port um, is any kind of connection between a bus and a device, right? So um, one of the most common kinds of ports, is a thing that we use all the time, is a USB port, right? We use that for everything from charging up our iPhone to, uh, to plugging in a memory storage device to our computer, right? And then finally, we have um, input-output devices, sometimes called I.O. devices, sometimes called peripherals. You'll notice in computer language, there's a lot of different names for one thing. Uh, so I will generally call them input-output devices. And these can be used to transmit data to and from the computer. So uh, inputs would be things like your keyboard, mouse, uh, stylus, and outputs are things like the monitor, the speaker, printer. Okay, we're going to watch this video real briefly. So he's using everyday objects 
from the kitchen to make what he's calling robots, right? Now, are they technically robots? No, they look kind of like robots, right? Um, so they, a robot technically is able to emulate some of the actions of a human being, right? And largely, the way that we think about robots now um, have to do with artificial intelligence, we'll talk about in a minute. But he calls them robot recipes. And if anyone feels overwhelmed by computers or by uh, a class on digital imaging, recipes are a really safe place to start, right? Because everything that a computer does is following some form of recipe, right? So we'll talk about what that looks like now. What we're talking about when we talk about these recipes that computers follow is an algorithm, right? Um, so very similar to baking a cake, right? Um, there's a specific set of commands that I will follow, and they're very specific, like how much sugar I need to add, how many eggs, um, at what temperature does it need to be cooked, and for how long. And then there's also an end point. There's a point where the recipe stops and the cake is baked. The cake is finished, right? The same is true for an algorithm. It has a set of, it has a start point. It has some very specific ingredients that it needs. It also has very specific instructions it needs to follow. And then it has a stop point, right? If it doesn't have that stop point, it's technically not a recipe or an algorithm, right? So it needs all of those components. Other things that we might call it, are machine languages or components um, when we're talking about software. But like I mentioned, algorithms, instructions for a task, well then what is a computer program? It's just a set of interrelated algorithms. So just like a CPU in the hardware side is integrated circuits, a program on the software side is just integrated algorithms. Right? Um, then there's subroutines. These are algorithms that are written and stored once, but accessed access from multiple points. And that's a key part of how different machine languages work. They're accessing different stored algorithms, different subroutines. And so they call them subroutine libraries that a given code can call up. Um, if you're curious, like, what's an example of that? Well, HTML is a machine language, right? It's a form of code. And uh, anytime you click on a link, right, it's accessing a library of information that tells us what should happen when someone clicks on a link, right? So it doesn't have to repeat that. Um, every time I write a link, I don't have to do some complicated code to explain how linking works. No, I just access the library, and the complicated code is stored there. And so every time I click on a link, it doesn't matter which link, which one of the trillions of links are out there, they all access that same point. Artificial intelligence, sometimes called machine learning or um, deep learning, uh, is largely what I think about when I think about robots at this point. Um, but these are complex logic and decision-making algorithms. So logic is a key part of how computers work, right? Um, and it is a point of major frustration for people who work with computers. It's trying to figure out how something that is intuitive or how a process that seems obvious for humans, like just differentiating between a cat and a dog, right? How to make that a logical statement that can be understood by a machine, right? Um, and then finally, operating systems. Operating systems are your friends. They are there to make all this complicated stuff that's happening in the background more accessible and more user friendly. Now, at the same time, in their uh, goal of making things more user friendly, you'll also find that they make your lives slightly more complex. What would be an example of that? Well, I am trained on CT scanning with Siemens operating systems and with GE operating systems, right? I do not fully understand how a Philips operating system or a Toshiba operating system works. Do I understand what CT is? Yes. Am I registered for CT? Yes. But I do not understand those operating systems. So if you sat me down in front of a Toshiba scanner, it's going to take me a day or two before I really feel comfortable operating that machine. Why? Because of the operating system. Just because of the operating system. I'm needing to learn its user interface. 
But more general examples and maybe something from your everyday life is which, are, which do you use? Normally a PC and running Windows or a Mac computer running uh, 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 Microsoft OS, right? A lot of times we feel more comfortable with one or the other, right? I've tried to learn both to some degree so that I feel comfortable with both. All right, we're going to watch this video real quick. That is a common application point. Uh, and so to, to unpack where that might be helpful for us in the hospital, one of the things that the documentary goes on to talk about is algorithms for uh, kidney donor programs, right? Where we have to um, transport uh, a kidney from one patient to another patient, right? Across an area um, in, a, in a very small window of time. Right? And sometimes we've got not just one patient, but two or three patients or four um, who need the kidney. And so there's a massive web of swapping that has to occur. And so that's a common place where algorithm, algorithms are employed very um, consistently to make sure that we're able to do those surgeries. Um, but we use them quite a bit, and it's one of the reasons why uh, uh, corporations roll out things like electronic medical record systems is they're looking at what are the processes for how we bring patients back, um, what are our exam times, what are ways to be more efficient in the way that we're working. So they have applications, like he's saying, not just within the computer world, but also within everyday life. But let's look a little bit more closely at how these different parts work, and you'll notice there's a learning objective that looks specifically at the CPU. So the central processing unit manipulates the data and tells the computer how to carry out software instructions, right? Um, it's divided into two basic components. There's a control unit that um, directs the flow of data from memory to a logic unit, and then there's this arithmet er arithmetic or logic unit um, that performs all the calculation and logic functions um, that are vital to how the programs work. So both operate on data stored in primary memory, right? So not within the hard drive or within a USB stick. They're both working on data that's stored um, right there in the uh, RAM or the uh, access memory points that are on the motherboard. So we'll look at what that looks like in just a sec. Here's the um, anatomy of a basic basic, basic computer. And these are the things that we need to understand about it. That it has some form of power, right? It has a power supply, an electrical power supply. Um, and then here at the core of it, we have this area right here, which is the CPU, the central processing unit. It's attached to this larger piece of circuitry here called the motherboard. So that big piece of circuitry there we'll call the motherboard. And you'll notice it's very close to these memory slots, the RAM. Because we said that the way that the CPU works is it's accessing things from memory, from that random access memory and applying logic functions to it. So that's why they're situated so closely together. And then, of course, we have areas for expansion and things like that. If you understand those parts of the motherboard, you're good to go. So it has a CPU, it has RAM, and it has expansion slots, right? Um, there's also, separate from that motherboard, a hard drive. And we can think about this as basically external memory. Even though it's there within the computer case, um, as, it, as you were, um, it is external to the CPU, it's external to the motherboard, um, and so it functions differently from the RAM. Uh, you'll also notice one of the things just worth noticing right here is a fan, right? Um, these things do produce quite a bit of heat, and heat actually impedes their processing. So if you, who here has ever been in the PAX storage suite or the PAX network area? No one. Um, if you ever have a chance to go in there, it's quite interesting. It is, hands down, one of the coldest rooms in the hospital, right? The reason it's cold is because all of those servers are producing a tremendous amount of heat, and heat impedes the way that the integrated circuits are working. So they want them cold. They're going to work better. All right, we are going to watch uh, this video on how a CPU works. And 
Okay. So, memory, as we can imagine at this point, is pretty important stuff. Um, <coughs> internal memory is that, uh, that RAM, right? It resides within the processor, um, and it's labeled for the CPU, right? Uh, primary memory uh, is those things that are necessary for the computer to function. Right? So an uh, example of that would be like the bootstrap program that's there when you first turn a computer on. It's going through uh, instructions and addresses within the primary memory. Right? Secondary memory um, is stuff that's essential to a program but not to the computer. So there's some free spots within the computer's RAM for that kind of instruction, right? So that when I start, for example, Microsoft Word, that program is going to send a set of instructions to RAM, right, that as I'm using that program, it can access more readily, right? Now, you may be wondering, where is that important, right? Well, has anyone ever been using their phone or their computer and it starts to go really, really slow, right? And then you look to see how many programs am I actively running, right? Like you double click on your iPhone or you run the, the tools list on your, your PC and you see, oh my goodness, I'm running all of these other programs. So what do we do? We turn off all those other programs, right? And all of a sudden the phone works better or the PC is running quicker, right? Um, that's the way that secondary memory can start to impede the processing power of the computer. We see this all the time in the hospital, and that's why a lot of the uh, imaging computers and radiation therapy treatment computers that we use um, a lot of times have very simple operating systems and also a ton of memory, right, that we never ever even have to use. Why? Because we're only operating one, one program with that memory, um, but it's so that we never slow the thing down. Uh, Volatile memory um, is only uh, stored when the device is powered on. So an example of this is you've probably been working on a paper or something, all of a sudden the power goes out, right? Everything that we were just working on just got lost. Why? Because it was being stored in a volatile way. It was solely dependent on the computer being powered on for its storage. We had not yet saved it to the hard disk. Um, Non-volatile memory is um, saved regardless of whether the computer is on or off, right? So an example of that again is that bootstrap program that's back in uh, a specific point within the RAM, right? So you might say, well, you just called that primary memory. Well, a lot of these things can be used interchangeably. So you'll notice that the next, for example, the next thing is RAM, random access, mem access memory. So within the RAM, there is non-volatile memory, right, that is used for primary memory, right? So those things are kind of interrelated, right? So uh, an example of uh, volatile memory and where it might be situated, um, we might have accessed a word processing document within the ROM, within the read-only memory, right? And so we're working on it from secondary memory using a Microsoft Word program, and our work is being stored in a, non -vol in a volatile place, right? Because we're processing, we're act actively typing on the document, right? So all of these terms are used interchangeably. And so I, I challenge you as you're looking at this memory stuff to see how those, they interrelate. The two ways that I've just illustrated are the primary ways that these terms illustrate, uh, interrelate, okay? And the big takeaway here is that um, internal memory is those things like the RAM, and within the RAM there is primary memory given to things that the computer needs to operate, and that stuff is also uh, non-volatile. And again, like the video on CPUs pointed out, random access memory, one of the advantages of it is it's similar to um, like a CD or something like that where you can skip to the different tracks, right? 
So the, we can, the computer program can skip to different areas within the memory to access different points, and we're calling that random access, right? That it can access anywhere within the data that it needs. Um, versus ROM is read-only memory. It can be read at very high speeds, but it's not capable of change after the manufacture, right? So it's only gonna be read this one way. The, can't, the computer can't print out to it or anything like that. Okay, secondary storage devices. Uh, things like external memory. So a lot of times when we think about memory, we think about these secondary storage devices. Um, another word for them might be the external memory. Um, these can be inside the computer case, but they're not directly addressed by the CPU. So they're things outside the motherboard. So the hard, the hard drive or the hard disk um, is a secondary storage device. And these, the ways that they work is they are coated with a magnetic material and it can be read or written to electromagnetically, right? Um, this is one of the reasons why we don't want to put really powerful magnets on top of our computer case, right? Particularly not in the area of the hard drive, right? Um, so having magnets close to computers in general, not a good idea. In fact, if you want to ruin a computer monitor, just hold a magnet up to it, right? Um, it's using magnetics to uh, do what it does. Um, so within the hard disk, data is recorded on individual circular tracks that form concentric rings. And a lot of times we have multiple disks stacked on top of each other, um, almost like a jukebox or something like that. Arrayed is a redundant array of independent disks, and these are two or more hard drives that duplicate storage of the same data. These are super helpful um, in healthcare, and we use them in different ways. One of the primary ways that we use them is that even though we've got a PAX network and a server that's stored there at Baptist, we have a separate PAX server that operates as a RAID in a different state, like in Arizona, right? And a hospital in Arizona probably has their RAID at the PAX um, closet in, in Baptist, right? That's just a hypothetical. Why would they do that? Well, the weather is different in Arizona than it is in Memphis, Tennessee. Well, why does that matter? Well, when there's a thunderstorm or the power goes out in Arizona, chances are the same thunderstorm and the same power outage did not hit Memphis, Tennessee, right? So even though the power is out in Arizona, we can still access our data from our connection to the hospital in Tennessee, right? So we do this as a way to back up our information because the information drives so much of what we do. <laughs> so that's why we have these redundancies, these built-in places where data is duplicated. We still use magnetic tape, and one of the most common places for magnet magnetic tape is MRI and CT. They use tape drives a lot of times to store previous exams. There's requirements for storing the raw data of exams, and so a lot of times they'll have a magnetic tape <laughs> library um, where the, uh, the raw data for the exam is stored. We don't generally store that raw data to PACS because it's just too big. Um, we might use CD and DVD. That's just another form of external storage devices. And then flash memory is probably the most common one that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you'll notice not included here is the, is the cloud drive. Because frankly, I don't think anyone except for like maybe five people in this world understand how the cloud works, right? Um, I do, will not claim to know how the cloud works. And you'll notice within hospitals, we don't use the cloud, right? Because there's still all sorts of security questions around how the cloud works, who actually understands how the cloud works, and how would it be um, potentially a threat. All right, switching gears just a little bit to talk about the different types of data that we are working with as x-ray techs. Analog versus digital is the way that we need to think about this. Analog data works on a continuous scale, right? An example of that would be something like a trombone, right? You can slide the trombone and you can produce any note, right? Even notes that don't exist in the musical scale. Right? Notes that we would not recognize as like an A or a B or an E. 
Analog data is exactly the same. It can be anything within this continuous value, right? Digital has a discrete scale. What does that mean? It has very specific definitions for each level of the scale, right? So an example of that would be a piano, right? On a piano, I can't play something that's anything other than an A, B, C, D, E, F, or G, right? That's all I can play on a piano because it has a very specifically defined discrete set of notes, right? Looking at this illustration here, we've got on the left a analog scale, right? It is all of these different shadings, right? Everything from something like white to things that are less than white, right? Versus the discrete scale over here, I've only got seven discrete options, right? So if I were to ask which of these is analog, it is column A, versus which of them is digital, it's column B. So we need a device to convert between these two things. Because what we're receiving when we do a port film or we do an x-ray or a CT or any of these imaging, we are receiving largely what I would call analog data. The C, the x-rays are coming through the patient, the remnant beam, and what we're getting is just waves and statistical variations, right, in this phenomena of photon flux. But we need to convert that over to digital. And as long as that conversion is done in a way to where the, the output data, the discrete units, are smaller than what we can detect with our eye or with our hearing or what have you, the digital data um, will improve that readout accuracy. So if I store analog data, I have to store the whole thing, right? The whole um, continuous wave of stuff. But if I convert it to discrete digital data, right? I read that out, I, can, I have a lot more processing power over that. Why? Because the computer speaks discrete, right? It understands discrete concepts. So the various intensities of x-rays can have any value, right? We're going to call that an analog transmission. But for digital imaging systems, we need values that are converted over to a discrete unit. And it needs to happen very quickly. So that is the job of the ADC. It's a computer embedded in these systems whose sole job is to take all these trillions of analog interactions and produce discrete um, numbers from those, values from them. Okay, switching gears yet again. When we think about discrete data, you'll notice that chart on the, on the right I had, uh, had ones through seven, right? But I said that a computer only works with binary, yes or no, on or off, one or zero, right? Well, the way that we work within the computer language to have a seven or to have a six um, is what we're talking about um, when we talk about the dynamic range, right? And particularly, this is always expressed in powers of two, right? So when we talk about um, how many megabytes a computer is, we're no longer using scientific language. We're using computer language, right? Um, we're using powers of two. Any matrix size for CT or for mammography or for any imaging modality is expressed as a power of two. So CT matrix sizes are generally 512 by 512, right? If a number is not a power of two, then it can't be binary, right? So a simple test would just be to find its square root, right? And keep squaring the root until we figure out what is its simplest square root, right? Um, data is stored in bits. Eight bits equals one byte. At this point, in terms of like what you need to know about bits and data storage, we, that's all, that's it, right there. Just know that uh, eight bits equals one byte. Um, when we talk about uh, kilobytes and stuff like that, uh, we again are expressing things 
in base two. So kilo, <laughs> mega, giga are binary expressions, not metric. Machine languages are going to be those instructions that the computer follows as a way to enrich its binary understanding, right? Um, they are used on all uh, uh, computers, right? At some level. Some of them are very simple. Uh, so all of these languages can be reduced down to binary at some point, just like what we were seeing in that video of the CPU. That the way that the information was being stored within the RAM was within binary. The way that it's being thought about within that logic system is a product of these instructions in a code. So examples of this are things like BASIC, C++, Java. These are machine languages. Um, compilers are then used to translate those instructions um, to the source code, which is what is processed by the CPU. So these languages are calls to different compilation li uh, compiler libraries, right? And those libraries are then what are fed into the CPU. So any application has to be written in a specific language or a specific code, and then the computer has to use that code to understand what the program's telling it. Mm -hmm. um, and it uses those to carry out specific tasks. Then any file, as you know, um, that's generated within that language or by that program has to be accessed again by that program. We can't use a separate program or a separate set of languages to understand that file, right? We run into these kinds of problems all the time. Okay, the textbook defines four different methods of processing, and this will be important for us um, as we think about ways to apply what we're learning to the clinical uh, setting, as well as thinking about how actual images are produced, because the four different methods of processing are used to produce every single image that we have ever made, right? Mm -hmm. The first is online processing. And this is processed immediately after command. So anytime I dial in, I'm going to do a PA chest x-ray, and I punch that into the control console, that is an online processing. It's saying, okay, I'm on. He wants to do a PA chest x-ray. Batch processing, it's what's occurring when I actually hit the expose button, and the x-rays are passing through the patient and spewing out all this analog data, right? It's batch processing that analog data to produce discrete values. So the analog to digital converter is doing batch processing. Real-time processing is an array of processors that all work together, right, um, to f do just a few operations, right? An example of that we'll see as the pr trimester progresses is image pre-processing, right? So once we've got the digital data, the computer then has to bat has to uh, a real-time process it to produce a picture. And then finally, time sharing is what we're doing with PACs. It's any time that we have a large uh, central computer that's servicing numerous other computers, right? So the PAC server does uh, time sharing. It makes the illusion of, uh, of, of all these other computers appearing to work when we all know that if the PAC server goes down, the entire department goes down, right? The final kind of takeaway set of definitions here has to do with teleradiology. Now this term is a little dated, but we still continue to use it, right? Because we're no longer using things like telephone modems and stuff like that. We're using much more complicated and sophisticated devices, but the term has stuck. So teleradiology refers to any remote transmission and viewing of radiographic images. It's pretty much all y'all know. Um, but for me, as an x-ray tech, uh, when I first uh, was starting out, there were student jobs where you were just a film courier. All you did was move physical images from one facility to another. Why? Because a person came into this ER, but they're having surgery at this other facility. So we had to take the films from this ER and drive in our car to that other facility. You can imagine that was a lot of human resource man hours required just to move stuff 
like an image around. So teleradiology is that remote transmission and viewing of radiographic images. The way that this is accomplished is through networking, right? And the first kind of network that we use is a LAN. This is just a local access network. So the college, for example, has a LAN. The things like access to the library, access to Moodle, should work a little bit better here at the school. Why? Because I'm actually on the local area network. Um, so this is generally something within a single building or business or geographic location. Um, a WAN is a wide area network, and it's a network that extends to other businesses or locations. Uh, most of what we do with PACs is a WAN, right? a wide area network. There's ways to access it from outside of the business. Another example of this is the internet, kinda, right? Um, it's, now, it's now a misnomer to, to talk about the internet. The reality is, is there's probably four different internets at this point. China has an internet that looks very different from ours, and they have controls over their internet that work very different from ours. America has a different internet from the way Europe's internet works, right? And so there's all these different kinds of internets in different accesses, controlled again by a wide area network. PAX is that picture archiving and communication system that we've become so familiar with. Um, I have it indicated here that it's, it's a LAN that stores and shares radiographic images. It's probably a typo. I would call it a wand, right? I'll fix that. Um, a HIS is again a hospital information system or sometimes called an EMR, electronic medical record. Uh, an example of this is EPIC. We're all familiar with EPIC, right? We've all got training in that. And then finally, a RIS is a radiology system uh, information system and an example of that is Radiant, which is made by the same company that makes EPIC. All right, I do wanna share one last video with y'all.